And the Mavericks are on the board. The Broncos coming in. The Miami Red Hawks. St. Cloud State University up in Colorado College is off and running here tonight. In Denver National Champions. Who's going to beat these guys? The history of college hockey dates back to before World War II. Prior to 2011, the CCHA and WCHA had mostly dominated the sport. With Penn State announcing a men's college hockey program, ripples were sent across the landscape. And so Brian Faison, who was the director of athletics at the University of North Dakota, Peg Bradley Doppis, who was the director of athletics at the University of Denver, and myself, ended up meeting in a, in a comfort suite just outside the Denver airport. We went over to a little table that was kind of in their breakfast area and we sat down and we took out a piece of paper and we started to sketch out what would later become the NCHC. Those sketches wouldn't be worthy of a museum but would lay the groundwork for one of the most dominant runs in college hockey history. It was a difficult conversation because we knew it was gonna disrupt the hockey world, um, but we had a commitment to our institutions and we had a commitment to the game at a high level, um, and we knew we had to take this leap of faith. And when I started to hear of the teams that were moving into what became the NCHC, I, like, I was blown away because you took two really good programs out of the CCHA, you took six real blue blood successful programs coming out of the WCHA, combining them into what really became a super conference. The first thing is, is what is that going to look like, right? You know, and uh, when, when you got to talking about the member institutions that were going to be a part of this, uh, there, there became some certainty as far as going to be a good thing going forward. Um, you know, obviously when the Big Ten realigned itself and, and then left uh, some teams looking to find a conference. With some of the most successful programs looking to retain their strength within the sport, work continued behind the scenes. After about two to three weeks of daily uh, combing sources, I uh, came to the conclusion that it was definitely real. I, I can't tell you how happy I am you could all join us here today. Uh, this is a, a wonderful occasion for all of us and for those of us who enjoy seeing hockey at the highest levels. Uh, this, is, this is a monumental occasion. I remember laying awake at night uh, before that event and just you know, keeping my fingers crossed that we'd done the right thing. A lot of people were counting on us. I mean, we were talking about people's livelihoods here. We were talking about experiences of students, um, students who had committed to go to WCHA or CCHA schools who were now going to be in this new league that nobody knew about. And so, the National Collegiate Hockey Conference was born with Colorado College, the University of Denver, Miami University, the University of Minnesota Duluth, the University of Nebraska Omaha, and the University of North Dakota. I mean, I think it all started um, of institutions that thought about their men's ice hockey programs very similarly. We wanted to win conference championships, wanted to win national championships, were investing in their, in their programs at a high level and, and wanted to be surrounded by other programs that were thinking the same way. And so I think the initial group of institutions that founded the conference definitely was that. And as the conversation uh, went on to other institutions, eventually St. Cloud State and Western Michigan, um, that same thought and philosophy was, was part of um, the discussion as, as we got to the point of adding those two institutions. Again, adding St. Cloud to that regional rivalry I think ended up being really important for the league. Um, you know, Western is, is brought to an element to uh, not just to being a regional rivalry to Miami, they're really not to the other schools, but they've really fit in pretty well with the style of play and, and everything about uh, how they run their program within the league. With the institutions in place, selecting the league's first commissioner was a top priority. Well, the selection of a commissioner was a, a difficult process for us. Um, again, not everybody knew what the NCHC was. Uh, we needed somebody who could sort of see the future and recognize that a new college hockey conference with this group of schools could be successful. We did do a national search. The committee ultimately decided on former U.S. Olympic Committee CEO, Jim Shear. He also had incredible background with different um, groups who could provide sponsorship support for us. And as we thought about what's going to happen with our championships, how are we going to do different revenue streams, how are we going to engage uh, in, in terms of things like corporate documents, who's going to help us get there. With the staff taking shape, office space was next on the to-do list, 
and Colorado Springs emerged as the front runner. First 10 national championships came here, and so uh, there was a history just surrounding the game. So Bill Hibble, who's the CEO of the El Pomar Foundation, was passionate about Colorado Springs becoming the epicenter of amateur sports in the United States. And he was willing to invest to make sure that all the top amateur sports organizations were housed there. That ultimately included the NCHC as they began their rise to the top. With the office location secured, things seemed to be coming together for the conference. However, unexpected changes were on the horizon. We were in a really good spot when Jim walked out, but we had to figure out where do we go from there. With the start of the inaugural season months away, there was an urgency to fill the top leadership role. One of the things we realized really quickly with Josh Fenton was he probably picked up everything with the league faster than everybody with the finances, with the bylaws, with the back of house support, uh, with what we were doing in both in Colorado Springs and the Twin Cities, what we were doing with television contracts. And while he was relatively young at the time, and he was an associate AD at Miami of Ohio, um, I think we realized that he is smart, hardworking, ambitious, and if we really wanted to make this league go, he was the right guy. I think it's important to remember that I was a part of the conference formation from kind of day one. And so I was involved in pretty much every administrative meeting that the group of athletic directors had in forming the conference. This is well in advance of, of Jim being hired. And so I think my knowledge and background of, of the conference and how it came together and who the member institutions were and had developed uh, kind of a rapport and relationships with the athletic directors, the coaches, helped me once it got to that point. Ultimately, it proved to be the right decision. Fenton would serve as the second commissioner, continuing the rise of the NCHC. Very historic night here in Oxford, Ohio, the first ever NCHC game. With teams competing for the regular season championship, the winners would forever be tied to the history of college hockey. Well, it was important for the league to name the championship trophy after Julian Spencer Penrose. Uh, it's entirely possible that modern college hockey wouldn't be what it is today without the Penrose family. And, you know, they, they were so instrumental in the first 10 NCAA championships at Broadmoor World Arena. So doing the introductory event in the Penrose house, understanding the Penrose's involvement in college hockey from the start, it just seemed natural. The first Penrose Cup came down to the final night between St. Cloud State and North Dakota, with the Huskies ultimately prevailing. And given that we weren't one of the initial six, I think it, it was a little bit, to be honest, of an exclamation point to say, look, you made the right decision. Here we are, um, we belong with this group and we can compete. Uh, and we showed you that through throughout the season. It's so tough to win in our league. And you know, everybody seems to get measured on winning national championships. Like, you know, you haven't done anything until you won a national championship. You know, it's true to some regard, but it's not true in the fact that like, if you go through the NCHC, uh, 24 game schedules with the rigors and the competition and you come out on top, you've done a lot of really good things. The madness didn't stop there. As every March, the conference heads to the state of hockey to crown its tournament champion. We were looking at the Twin Cities and for those schools that moved to the NCHC from the WCHA, we'd been used to going to the XL Center for the WCHA Final Five. Uh, it was the best championship in college hockey. Massive crowds, incredible energy, and big gates. And so we were hoping we could replicate that with the NCHC. Uh, we believed, at least in starting uh, for the league, in helping us build our brand initially, that Target Center was the right spot for us. They committed a lot um, in terms of getting the building ready for hockey. Um, from the financial standpoint, bringing in the city of, of Minneapolis to support it. There was some games that we played at the Target Center back in the day. So there was some familiarity with that building. And, you know, again, it was like, oh, that's a basketball building. But, you know, um, you know, being in downtown Minneapolis, I think it was a great spot, right? And I think your fans expect, you know, it was an event, right? And uh, so now that we, you know, we went through that, I think uh, it got better and better. We went to the tournament um, just trying to play our best hockey and we, 
we were fortunate enough to win that tournament and it was like it was we celebrated pretty hard especially out on the ice like on that game just because we know we got an automatic bid and it, it meant something special in the sense that we were the first team to win that the nchc needed to showcase itself to a national audience and help build its brand this is one of the things that we also worked on before the conference was fully announced and you know before we got to our first season was a national television partnership. And it was really about visibility, national exposure, storytelling, helping to establish and build brand. I think one maybe underestimated factor is the uh, people who have been calling the games. Right away you get on national TV and the guys calling them are veteran college hockey guys that everyone in college hockey knows. Everyone knows Dave Starman, everyone knows Ben Holden. And I thought those guys played a pretty key role in, you know, legitimizing the league within uh, the college hockey community. Dave Starman, Ben Holden, Shereen Sasky, all of our crew, great to have you with us. You flip on the TV and you hear Ben and Dave calling a game right away. Uh, it feels like a big game. When it came to the NCHC, what you did was you combined the best conference in college hockey with, I think, the best national televised product in college hockey. So you got a nice little combination there. We came in with a lot of veteran experience. We came in with, with a brand. We came in with an idea. We came in with a philosophy. And our idea was to sell the programs. I think that's what sets us apart from other networks is our goal is to work in concert with the programs, in partnership with the programs, so that we are selling them. That sales pitch worked perfectly as the league would continue to enhance the student athlete and fan experience. I think it was a natural progression for fans because they knew the building of what it was in the past, whether it be college hockey, pro hockey, high school hockey, whatever. Um, and so I think it just kind of gave the conference an additional lift in terms of engagement and people attending the event. And, you know, we saw it continue to grow over time. After four years at Target Center, the NCHC had the opportunity to move across the river into the premier hockey venue in the Midwest, XL Energy Center. Going back um, to the XL, I think, legitimized the conference. Um, once again, it said, you know, we, we tout ourselves as the premier league in college hockey. And, and we have, you know, premier coaches, we have premier players, we have premier facility. Um, and I think it just continued to build up. To me, this area just, it bleeds hockey. Between the local places that are here and the buzz on a night when the Minnesota Wild are playing, I just think that you take a look at this building and you think big time hockey and the, the frozen face is a big time event because generally the four teams that are in that event are all going to the national tournament. And as of late, one of them tends to win it. It starts off with, you know, you're dreaming as a kid, um, you know, to play in the state tournament as a kid. And, you know, I did that once and, you know, it's super special to play with my high school teammates. And then uh, when you get to college and, you know, you're trying to win the NCHC championship and it's on that ice, it's, it's obviously super special, you know, being downtown St. Paul. And, um, you know, it's kind of it's kind of early March and, you know, the, the season's changing. And obviously my debut as well was in that building, too. So super, super special building and a lot of fun, you know, playing in those games there. Cates's rich history on that ice includes taking part in arguably the greatest game in NCHC Frozen Faceoff history, the 2019 Double Overtime Championship game. Yeah, that was that was a great game. Um, you know, I've been a freshman and you know, kind of playing for that NCHC championship for the first year was was a very intense game. Um, you know, two of the best teams um, in the league. I think uh, St. Cloud was number one most of the year and. You know, we ended up winning the national championship that year, but we were ranked one or two, so two powerhouse teams that um, you know weren't willing to give an inch for each other. So it just built that um, that rivalry in a really nice way. Anytime you're into in a championship that goes into overtime and then double overtime, um, there's just so much energy and anticipation. That would be the conference's last time on that ice for a while, as the world would come to a halt 
forcing the NCHC to innovate. There were concepts of this, right, that were out there, but they were concepts of this at the highest level of our, our sporting ecosystem. I think we all were walking on eggshells trying to figure out what was going to happen. And so when Josh came to us with really this pie in the sky idea of what would it look like? I mean, there had been nothing done like that before. Um, I think that it piqued our interest immediately. Uh, it was innovative. Um, we thought we could do it. Um, you know, obviously as a single sport league, it gives us probably a little bit more um, ability to, to navigate and adapt to conditions. After months of daily meetings with more than a dozen entities and detailed planning with the University of Nebraska Medical Center, Omaha emerged as the home for the NCHC pod. Well, I think Josh Fenton, the, the former commissioner, always talked about how important student athlete experience was. And a lot of times it's just a line that everyone says and you just kind of, you know, as a journalist, you're like, okay, you know, of course everyone's saying it, do they actually uh, believe it? And I thought the pod was kind of backing that up. So by crafting hotel, food, medical, uh, we created an environment, I think, that was going to ensure that it was going to be a safe environment in which, with the bet to the best of our ability, we could uh, create a, a situation where we could keep players safe and get the competition done. I will tell you this, the pod was the envy of the entire college hockey world. I can't tell you how many coaches from other conferences were calling me during the pod to say, how cool is what we're watching? Is it, is it really as unique as, as it looks? Delayed by two months, the 2020-2021 NCHC season officially started with 38 games in 21 days at Baxter Arena. You know, it was much more like a pro schedule and I think the guys appreciate it. I think that for me as a coach, I, I liked it because it, it changed your preparation or your thinking sometimes, uh, you know, when you're only going off a day or two. And um, so it was kind of fun to, to, to kind of change that up. Obviously I was excited, um, you know, there wasn't too much hope that year and um, in college hockey for a lot of teams, but, you know, I knew the NCHC was, was working hard and going to do a good job to, you know, get us on the ice and uh, they did a great job with that pod in Omaha. The coaches, the players, the staffs, everybody trying to do their best to make sure we maintained a safe environment, that we were able to get it pulled off without a major hitch, uh, that we were able to really um, have something that's successful. So we were all extremely proud of, of what we did. With fans not allowed in venues, the conference's digital network, nchc.tv, became an even more critical asset. The NHL was in its break, so like my phone was just buzzing from like former players in the NHL, like how do I watch this game? Like everybody was watching the pod games. But we wanted it to be a place where they could come on Wednesday or Tuesday or Monday and catch video on demand that was there. And I think that has served its purpose. Now it's evolved even more to where it's a little bit of a um, one-stop shop for any and all things digital for the NCHC, whether it be standings and stats and um, obviously live video and video on demand continues to be there. And so I think it's a powerful tool for the league from a brand building standpoint and also from a revenue standpoint. And, glad to see it continue to be successful. They know that NHL scouts are watching these games, GMs are watching these games, fans are watching these games, prospective coaches are watching these games. These games are being watched by a lot of different people for a lot of different reasons. While the NCHC found plenty of success off the ice, its teams were having just as much success on the ice. When you take a look overall, the quality of the buildings, the quality of the coaching, the quality of the exposure and the fact that you can have a chance to play for a national title alongside players that are going to play in the NHL. If I'm a young player, that's a pretty good formula to get me to play in this conference. The national accolade started with North Dakota goaltender Zane McIntyre, who won the second annual Mike Richter Award. Well, it was a special award in the fact that even though it's a, it's not a team award, it's an individual award, but he was the most team oriented guy that we've had in a long time. And, and he was intentional in his daily work. Like there was a reason why he won that award. His preparation and his details and his habits were impeccable. Two years later, the NCHC gloved its second Richter Award in Denver's Tanner Gillette, 
but he wasn't the only pioneer to earn a national honor that season. The 2017 Colby Baker Award winner goes to Will Butcher. <laughs> It was uh, kind of surreal when it happened, just like kind of all that, that whole weekend, like from the Hobie to winning the championship, like it just kind of all came together where, you know, team was playing really good, played well myself throughout the year and um, yeah, just very super grateful and um, was just very happy with like how everything obviously capped off like my college career. Three years later, another decorated NCHC defenseman, Scott Perunovich, capped his career with college hockey's highest honor. You know, you don't see a lot of guys, uh, defensemen, today's game that have his brain and offensive ability. He was like a fourth forward. You look at his, even his career uh, in three years, I mean, he was 30 to 40 points. He was leading, you know, one of our top scorers. Um, just the ability, the elusiveness, um, you know, nobody gives him enough credit. Those two Hobie winners and many other conference players and coaches have also represented their country on the world's biggest stage. In order to continually hold yourself to that standard, it takes premier coaches, it takes premier student athletes, it takes um, a commitment by our institutions to be at such a high level. The coaches that we attract in the NCHC are at the top of their game. Uh, and it's not just that they're um, high quality from a competitive perspective, they are high quality from a character perspective. They are people that students want to be around. The NCHC and their programs, again, are committed to competitiveness at the highest level and they're recruit recruiting a certain type of student athlete uh, that wants to compete at the highest level, whether that's for a Stanley Cup, whether for that's for an Olympic gold medal, whether it's for a national championship in college hockey. And so I think those that have had the fortunate chance and opportunities to move on to, to do those things are a reflection of how I think our programs have wanted to um, kind of push forward and, and treat their programs um, from the start of the conference. And even a select few individuals were given the honor to represent Team USA at the 2018 and 2022 Winter Olympic Games. A once in a lifetime opportunity and um, you know just very happy I went back for my senior year so that opportunity could could open up and um, yeah just to, to go overseas and you know play in that big of a stage and just kind of yeah once in a lifetime with all the different aspects of the the village seeing other events and different things like that it was super special and such a great um, moment for me. The NCHC has seen plenty of great individual moments but perhaps the best ones come from team competition as was showcased in one of the greatest games in NCAA history, which took place between two NCHC heavyweights in the 2021 Fargo Regional Final. There's no losers in that game, and I think that's uh, the one thing for me. I said to some people, like, we battled, like we always battle. Um, we got a bounce, break, um, and at the end of it, you know, nobody wants to lose, uh, but at the end of that, is there really any loser? Getting set for the second overtime period from Shields Arena, the Fargo Regional Final. Playing in that game, uh, even though that we lost, it, it was something that I'll remember for the rest of my life. And in and, and the fact that the endurance, the uh, the adversity, the uh, resiliency that that our players went through, and obviously Duluth as well. But you know, to go through that long period of time and well-conditioned athletes to play and ask them to you know pour their hearts on the ice each and every shift out there, it was amazing and I wouldn't want to do it any other way. And away we go when we continue to play as we enter the fifth overtime period. Yeah, it was just kind of survival mode at, at um, you know, kind of when the overtime started and, um, you know, body wasn't feeling too good. I don't think anyone was feeling too good, but, um, you know, we found a way and, you know, had an unsung hero, so it's an awesome story. And here comes Minnesota Duluth. They bring it on in. The NCHC placed two teams in the Frozen Four that season, with St. Cloud State finishing runner-up. But since its inception, no conference has had more Frozen Four participants or national champions than the NCHC. As they say, iron 
sharpens iron. So I think these teams get used to being forced to play at such a high level every single weekend, two games a weekend. And when it comes to the NCAA tournament, that's just what they're used to. They're used to going into it and playing at a high level. I think we went to a few frozen fours and we were knocking on that door each and every year and it was so hard to get there and, and, and you know, finally uh, capitalizing on the situation in Tampa, Florida. It was a situation where I thought it was special in the fact that it was the first one and then obviously, uh, you know, the NCHA fell into line with other member institutions winning it right after that. You know, just to, to be able to, to be in that position, you know, we were in it in 17, losing to Denver. Um, to get back there, um, you know, three years in a row, um, and to be able to win it uh, two years in a row um, certainly is, is probably something I'll never forget. The run continued with Denver winning the 2022 National Championship, giving the NCHC five titles in six tournaments. We all take a lot of pride, certainly I take a lot of pride in kind of what, what has been developed. Um, it's a collection of a lot of people and efforts from a lot of people pulling in a lot of different directions to, to get it to where it is. And so for me, it was never about a moment. So certainly there are great moments along the way, but it's more about building something special and seeing the vision early on come to fruition over time and continue to be successful, not just for a year or two, but for you know what now is going to be a, a decade. It is really unique what has been built. The other side of it is the family atmosphere that, that I think we've created here between the broadcast entities, the media entities, and the programs. It's, I think everybody understands we're in this together, and that's why this conference has become a success. I think everything we have done is about excellence. It's about excellence on the ice, it's about excellence in our protocols, it's about hiring the best officials that we can find, it's about hiring the best staff and, and being the most innovative, um, being a leader, being willing to take some risks and uh, try some new things. We've been here 10 years and we've had a lot of success through those 10 years and there's only great times to come ahead for us.